Hello, and welcome to your second support vector machine lecture, where we'll actually get to learn about support vector machines. To review, last time we talked about two models, the first of which was a maximal margin classifier. The maximal margin classifier uses a hyperplane to divide our space into two, having positive cases be on top of the hyperplane and negative cases being below the hyperplane. In a maximal margin classifier, we choose a hyperplane that perfectly divides between our positive and our negative cases, choosing a hyperplane that maximizes the margin between the closest data points and our hyperplane. However, we also talked about the fact that in real life, our groups of data points tend to overlap. So there is no one hyperplane that can perfectly divide our positive cases from our negative cases. In come the support vector classifier. Using Slack variables, the support vector classifier allows data points to be inside the margin instead of just on it, or even be on the incorrect side of the hyperplane. This allows us for some more flexibility to use a hyperplane to classify groups that are not linearly separable. So support vector classifiers solved a problem that we had with maximal margin classifiers. Similarly, support vector machines solve a problem that we have with support vector classifiers. Our new problem is that not all of our data is going to be linearly separable, even if we have the slack variables that we introduce with support vector classifiers. For example, with this data, no matter how big your slack variables are, there's no linear hyperplane that will be able to classify our blue data points in these groups from our pink data points in this group. On the right hand side, you can see an example of a support vector classifier trying to do this and pretty much failing. So what do we do when we want to use a support vector classifier, but our data is not even linearly separable? Introducing the kernel trick. When we take the kernel trick and apply it with support vector classifiers, we get support vector machines. You can see in these pictures that these are the types of classification boundaries that we would really like to draw, but we just can't with a regular support vector classifier. Let's take a step back so I can show you what the kernel trick is by example. Let's take this very simple data set that represents my happiness or unhappiness uh, with regards to how many chicken fingers I eat. You can see from this graph that I'm relatively happy when I eat about three to six chicken fingers, but I'm very not happy when I eat less than three or more than nine, probably because I'm either very hungry or overly full, respectively. Now, if I wanted to use a straight line to distinguish between the times when I am happy versus unhappy with the amount of chicken fingers I have, I can't really do it. If I put the line here, I'm misclassifying a bunch of my data points. The same thing happens here and here. No matter where I place my line, I just can't use a single straight line in order to divide my unhappy versus my happy cases. But what if I introduced a new variable, chicken fingers squared? All this is is taking my original variable and squaring it and making that my second predictor. Now, in this new two-dimensional space, I can use a straight hyperplane in order to classify happy from unhappy. It would look a little something like this. So, we just saw when we projected our data to a higher dimension, we were able to use a flat hyperplane in order to classify our two groups of data points, even though that wasn't possible with our original data. This projection into multiple dimensions is the basis of the kernel trick. A kernel, in the case of SVMs, is a function that calculates the relationship between two vectors or data points in multiple dimensions without actually making us calculate what the coordinates of those dimensions are. For instance, in our chicken example, we actually created the coordinates for our multiple dimensions. We actually had to calculate what all the chicken fingered squared values were and use those coordinates as if they were another predictor in our model. What the kernel trick says is that we can calculate the relationship between two data points without actually calculating those coordinates. To do so, we need to use a kernel. 
For example, in the chicken example, I use something called a polynomial kernel, which looks a little bit like this. This kernel says that the relationship between two data points is whatever this value equals. Here, x and y are our data points. R is something called the coefficient, and D is the degree, which are both hyperparameters that often we'll choose via some type of hyperparameter tuning. In the chicken fingers example, I used a polynomial kernel with D equals D or degree equals two and a coefficient equals one half. Plugging that in, we get that the kernel between two data points X and Y is equal to X times Y plus our coefficient one half to the second power. If we expand that out, we get X times Y plus one half times x times y plus one half. Expanding that out further, we get xy plus x squared y squared plus one quarter. Now this value can be expressed as the dot product between two points. Those two points would be x, x squared one half dot y, y squared one half. So you can see what we're doing here is basically creating a data set with three variables. The original variable, the variable squared, and then this constant one half, which since it's the same for all of our data points, we can just safely ignore. So basically, this is saying that we're calculating the relationship between two points as if those points are projected into a two-dimensional space, where the first dimension is just the variable by itself, and the second dimension is that variable squared, which, oh, looks really familiar to what we did with our chicken example. And notice that on this slide, I calculated these values without actually projecting my data into that second dimension. If I have two data points, x equals one, y equals two, I can just plug them into my kernel function and I can get their relationship as if I projected them into multiple dimensions without actually doing that projection. For instance, with these examples, I would get one times two plus one half, the coefficient we chose, to the second power. Expanding that out, we get one times two, plus one squared, which is one times two squared, which is four plus one quarter. In other words, the relationship between these two points is two plus four plus one fourth or six and one fourth. Now notice when I did that math to calculate the relationship between these points, never once did I take my data and project it to our two dimensional space. I just plugged it into our kernel. And that's what makes the kernel trick so special. Again, kernels allow us to calculate the relationships between two points as if we projected them into higher dimensions without actually having to do that projection. And we can use the polynomial kernel with a bunch of different coefficients for R or degrees for D. The D basically controls the maximum amount of dimensions that we could have. Now, the polynomial kernel is incredibly useful and very popular, but I also wanna to talk to you about a different kernel called the radial kernel, which is maybe even more popular. The radial kernel, which is represented by this equation here, basically acts as if it projects data into an infinitely dimensional space. Before, with our polynomial kernel, we projected our data into two dimensions. The radial kernel projects it into infinite dimensions. So now you can see why it's really important that a kernel function calculates the relationship between variables without doing the actual projection, because it would literally be impossible for us to project data into infinite dimensions. It turns out that the radial kernel acts like a weighted nearest neighbor classifier, where points that are further away from a data point have less influence on what the class of that data point should be. In order to prove to you that the radial kernel is basically projecting into infinite dimensions, I need to take a step back and review Taylor series with you. Remember, Taylor series are a way to rewrite a function as an infinite sum of a bunch of different parts. For instance, here we have the function e to the x. Here, we're using only the first of all of the infinite parts to approximate our function. And 
can tell it's uh, it's not doing too well. But when we add our second part, it's getting a little bit closer. And we add a third part, even better. Fourth, even better. Fifth, even better. Sixth, oh my gosh, even better. And seventh, even better. You can see that as we take all of the values in this infinite sum, we're getting closer and closer to our function e to the x that we're trying to approximate. Mathematically, you can write out a Taylor series like this as an infinite sum. And one really useful application of Taylor series, even though it's not what we're doing with them here, is that we can take only the first few of those infinitely many parts and use it as an approximation for our function, which is often simpler than our actual function. All right, let's get down to proving that our radial kernel is actually projecting data into infinite dimensions. In order to do that, we have to revisit our polynomial kernel. Remember that our polynomial kernel can take data and project it into up to d dimensions. Now, before we chose a coefficient value of 1 half, let's see what happens when we choose a coefficient value of 0. So here we have x times y plus 0, or nothing, to the power of d. All right, let's remember this for our next slide. So when we choose a coefficient of zero, it's a bit silly because it basically projects our data into a single dimension. When we choose a d of one, you can see that it basically projects the data into one dimension where the data is unchanged. When we use a degree of two, you can see that it projects the data into one dimension where every value is just itself squared. But what if we took a bunch of these polynomial kernels with coefficient zero and added them together? As you can see here, this would basically be like projecting our data into multiple dimensions, where the first dimension is just the variable itself, the second dimension is the variable squared, and we could actually keep going with this, where our third dimension is the variable cubed. Now, what if we did this, but over and over and over and over until infinity? That would be pretty cool. We're taking our data and we're projecting it into infinite dimensions. And we're doing it all by adding a bunch of polynomial kernels together. Well, it turns out this is essentially what our radial kernel is doing, and I'll prove it to you using Taylor series expansion. Taking our radial kernel and expanding it using some algebra, we get this value here. Gamma is just a hyperparameter that we can choose, so I'm going to set it to 1 half just so this pesky little 2 goes away. Now that I've had that, I get this function. So we are going to take this right-hand term, e to the xy, and we are going to use a Taylor series to rewrite it. I won't make you walk through all the math, but this is basically how you get the Taylor series of e to the x. Plugging in xy for x, we get this infinite series. Now, something interesting is happening here. So I've pasted our sum of infinite polynomial kernels below, and let's compare these two. Here, I see something really similar. Anything to the power of zero is one. So here, I see some matching terms. Similarly here, I see x to the power of one and y to the power of one, which, oh, I also see here. Similarly, here I see squared values, and here I see squared values. And continuing on and on, here I see infinite powers, and here I see infinite powers. So with some extra math that I won't be showing you, you can basically see how the radial kernel is basically projecting data into an infinite number of dimensions. Essentially, it's as if we calculated new features where the first feature is one for every variable, the second feature is itself, the third feature is the variable squared, and so on and so forth, up to infinite number of dimensions. So radial basis kernels basically have coordinates for infinite dimensions, which wouldn't actually be possible to calculate if it weren't for the kernel, which calculates the relationship between two points as if they were in those dimensions without actually forcing us to calculate those dimensions, which we couldn't because there is an infinite amount of them. Now, I skipped a lot of math at the end, which was as much for my sake as it was for yours. But if this is something you're interested in, I recommend StatQuest Support Vector Machines Part 3 video, which actually walks through not only the math that we talked about with Taylor Series Expansion, but finishes the entire thing if you really want to see the proof from start to finish.
Now that we've proved that radial kernels essentially project data into infinite dimensions and then use a hyperplane to separate the data in those dimensions, we can see what it actually can do. For instance, on the right hand side, we can see that original data set that we looked at classified using a support vector classifier, but with a radial kernel. When we pair kernels with support vector classifiers, we call them support vector machines. And as you can see, they allow us to have nonlinear boundaries using a linear model like the support vector classifier. All we have to do for a support vector machine is change a little bit of the notation that we have. Previously, this constraint told us that all of our data points have to be above or below the plane. Now we're rewriting it and all we're really adding here is this little phi function. This essentially says that we're creating a support vector classifier after transforming our data x using the function phi. Usually this will project our data into multiple dimensions. Similarly, in order to classify a new data point, we can use the same formula as before, except now instead of just our x's, we have our phi of x for both the data points. What the kernel actually does is calculate this dot product, phi of x times another phi of x, without actually forcing us to know what phi is, what that projection into multiple dimensions is. And to go back to something we talked about in the first lecture, it's really cool that where the hyperplane is and how to classify a new data point only relies on the dot product between two points kernels calculate that dot product as if they're in multiple dimensions without actually forcing us to calculate those dimensions, which makes our math a lot easier and makes these feasible to use even when we have kernels like the radial kernel that project into infinite dimensions. To review, we started with a maximal margin classifier, a hyperplane that perfectly divides our data into positive and negative cases. Then we realized that sometimes such a hyperplane doesn't exist. Data points might overlap between categories, or we might just wanna have a hyperplane that's not so affected by outliers. Support vector classifiers allowed us to do this by introducing a slack variable, which allows data points to be inside the margin or on the wrong side of the hyperplane. Sometimes we have groups of data that aren't going to be linearly separable, no matter how much slack you have. In comes the support vector machines, which pair support vector classifiers with kernels that project our data into multiple dimensions. This allows us to use a flat hyperplane to classify our data, even though in our current dimensions, that's not possible. The kernel trick is really cool because it allows us to calculate the relationship between two points as if they're in those higher dimensions without actually calculating those dimensions. This is really nice because often with the ever popular radial kernel, this wouldn't even be possible for us to calculate. So the kernel really saves us by allowing us to calculate relationships as if we did that projection. All right, that's all I have for you. I will see you next time.